Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar today where we are about to cover the best practices for a secure Active Directory migration. We're very, very happy to have a panel of experts on the line here with us today. Um, our first presenter of the day is going to be Mickey Bresman, the CEO of Semperis, and our second presenter, and who will carry the bulk of the presentation, uh, is Justin Harris, the Manager of Product Architecture at Binary Tree. A little bit of housekeeping before we actually start with the presentation. Uh, we're recording today's session, so if you want to review it later on or if you want to share it with colleagues, we'll be happy to be in touch soon with the recording link. And in addition, we plan to leave some time for audience questions at the end of today's presentation. So if you have anything that comes up you want to ask our panelists, please be sure to use the webinar question tool and we'll answer everything near the end of the presentation. Now, to kick things off today, I would like to launch a quick poll question to you, our audience. Um, and the first thing we would like to know from you is uh, whether or not you are planning to launch an Active Directory migration uh, within the coming year. And you can choose whatever answer you'd like, and then we could do a little sharing of the information with everyone. We'll give it a couple more seconds so you could all make the vote. Perfect. So let's share the results quickly so we could get started. Uh, it seems like more than half of you are actually planning on migrating Active Directory. Around 17% are not planning on Active Directory, and another about quarter of you uh, are not yet sure, so may or may not. With that, I'm going to give it back to Mickey Bresman to kick off the presentation. Thank you, Mintal, and, and hi, everybody. Uh, hi, Justin. Hey, Mickey. Um, hey, so I just wanted to start by saying thank you very much for joining us, uh, both to our audience and to uh, and to Justin, of course, I'm very happy to have an expert with so many years of experience in the immigration field joining us today. And we will start and we'll continue with the rest of the presentation talking about the migrations of Active Directory with um, how you should plan it, how to avoid the things that might go wrong, and so on. But I guess that the first question is even why do we do the Active Directory migrations? So I guess that you can divide those into several needs. The most common one, at least from my experience, is the M&A activities, meaning if you have two companies merging, even through an acquisition, or if it's an entire company or just a division of a company that is being merged into another company. And from my previous experience, I've helped several organizations to transfer just a certain division from organization A to organization B. And that, of course, creates all of the questions of how do you take a certain part only and you don't uh, expose and move too much from one side to the other. So the m and activities, I guess that's one of the reasons. The second reason is, I think, is even more interesting, well, at least from my perspective, and that would be if a company have created historically an active directory structure that is not appropriate for the current needs, um, just as an example, in the early days of the Active Directory, Microsoft used to provide a recommendation to create domains as a security boundary, which of course later become something that they uh, recommended not to do anymore. I'm, I'm sure that you guys know that today the recommendation is to have forest as a security boundary of the organization. And another recommendation that used to also exist in the past uh, was to have what is called today a single label domain. So for example, if the name of the organization was in Paris, then that would be the root name of the uh, DNS structure of that environment, as opposed to having something like DNS.com as an example. And that later on actually created um, a lot of headache for the organizations that got that structure. So there are different types of reasons of why would you want to restructure your Active Directory. And this is one of just one of the examples. Um, Justin, would you like to 
refer yeah. to them. Yeah. Yeah. That, so there's it, it's an interesting idea here that uh, personally I haven't seen years back. I didn't see this, and it wasn't as prevalent. But today. You know, most of my time is spent dealing with customers, talking about uh, Active Directory deployments or messaging migrations, and one of the common themes that I'm starting to see more and more now is the, the, the request and the project to consolidate or migrate Active Directory is really spawning from not so much an M&A, which I agree with you, that was always one of, one of the leading uh, reasons for an AD migration or to centralize something that was decentralized. But more and more organizations are coming up with security problems. And it's not always a public security exploit like Home Depot or Yahoo or something where it, it, it's front page in the news. But for larger multinational corporations that have Forest Trust pointing to all these different organizations and, and, and there's inheritance of permissions it just becomes a, a, a spider web of mess. It's difficult to, to understand who has permissions to what and based on that, that has driven a lot of recent consolidation and, and efforts to really take a critical look at what their Active Directory, what they have in their Active Directory now, and then to reformat and reshape their directory services infrastructure into something a little more manageable. So that, that's just a, a, an interesting thing. I, I think it's kind of the sign of the times uh, where, where we see that uh, you know, security is always top of mind for most of these corporations these days. Right. I, I want also just to add on top of that is that the fact that Active Directory, it's kind of hard to believe, but it has been in use with by organizations for over 17 years now, which yeah. is quite a period of time. And I'm sure it's not the same administrator back in early 2000 that, it, that uh, they have now that's administering their directory services infrastructure. You are most likely correct. <laughs> So one of the first questions that you know I, I I I find that most customers ask me is you know why why do I need you what could go wrong in an Active Directory migration and on the surface Active Directory may not seem quite as complex as maybe something like an Exchange migration where you have routing issues and mail is being sent uh, to, a, to a bunch of different exchange servers and it, it could be routing across a, a global footprint. Uh, you have end users that are connecting to, to exchange mailboxes. But Active Directory, you know, that it just kind of works. It, it's there in the background. Like Mickey, like you said, it's been around since 2000. It's typically not upgraded as frequently as line of business applications. So, you know, I think it's a valid question to ask here. You know, what could go wrong? Well, I certainly have stories to tell back in my administration and delivery days, and I'm sure Mickey has some of the same stories. A lot can go wrong, and when it does, typically it could be harder to troubleshoot than for instance, a messaging migration. So I, I, I wanted just to kind of state that question and answer it right up front and set expectations uh, of some of the good information that we're going to deliver and talk about today. So you know, first is permissions. That, that is the, the number one driver that you know, we need to ensure that we, we have proper planning and preparation around because if you disrupt your end users day to day, that that unhappiness and disruption of, of service that the, the end users are going to have, that's going to bubble up really quickly and it's going to put your project in a negative light and may cost the company money based on loss of productivity. So whether those permissions are accomplished through the use of SID history, whether you have a, a complex trust relationship and setup, uh, whether you have a bunch of groups that are used to, to 
to stamp permissions on, on files and folders and, and you choose to use SID history. What about the access tokens? You know, that that is something that could make you scratch your head just based on the, the inconsistent behavior nature uh, of token size problems. And then you know, there's problems with attributes that don't come over properly uh, or, or that uh, are not in scope to be synced that you thought they, they were. Or, you know, uh, Mickey, I'm sure you could speak to this. If something actually goes wrong and you actually have a, a true service outage with, with your directory services, how do you recover from that? You know, do, do you have a, a bona fide plan? Yeah, and I would uh, I would simply say that you now touching your Active Directory, and this is something that you probably have not done well to that extent in the past. And I think that one of the IT administrators that I'm, I used to work with in the past used to say about Active Directory that it is kind of like the electricity. As long as it's working, nobody really thinks about it, and and you just take it for granted that it's there. But as long as it, as as soon as it's out, all hell breaks through. I, I agree, and that's that's really what drives. You know, I'm going to talk about three specific issues that you know that they're going to come into play. Uh, but before that, let let's get into the the poll question. Thank you, Justin. Uh, just one last poll question. Uh, to our audience. I'm going to launch it right now. Uh, and this is a question where you could choose more than one option. So basically we're asking what are the key concerns you have around your need to migrate Active Directory? Um, and there are a bunch of things uh, that you could choose from here. So we'll give it a couple more seconds for people to be able to vote their concerns and we'll share the results and let everybody see what our audience today is thinking. All right, here we go, like five, ten more seconds. Um, and we will share the results here with you. So here we go. Um, it seems like uh, Everybody is pretty much, or not everybody around, uh, half of you are equally considering not having enough time or resources to plan well ahead of a migration. Um, more than half of you are worried about things that you might not think about in advance but may go wrong still. Uh, and then, again, another half or so are considering uh, a forest or domain failure or object or attribute changes that are hard to revert from, and then there are a few other concerns as well. Uh, with that, Justin, you can move forward with the actual plan. All right, thank you. So Mickey, right before the, the polling question there, was talking about that you know, Active Directory, just it just always works in the background. It, it is absolutely like electricity. You, you turn the switch on, you know, there, there is a certain conditioned expectation because it just always works. So, you know, what are the steps to, to ensure a successful migration around Active Directory because much like the electricity where it just always works, you probably haven't touched it uh, to the extent that you, you're leveraging and managing your line of business applications. So I'm going to talk about three things. and some of those things at a high level may seem simple, but it doesn't mean that it should be overlooked because based on my experience, when migrations go sideways, it can always be traced back to, in my opinion, one of these three things that I'm going to talk about. So the first thing is planning. A lot of work goes into a migration. You, know, you, you take into account all the different components that touch Active Directory. These days in, in a mobile-first, cloud-first world, what doesn't touch your directory services infrastructure for authentication? I, even your, you're probably leveraging your Active Directory 
for authentication to cloud-based applications, whether it be Salesforce or Twitter or, or something like that. So you, you spend a lot of time planning and, and making sure that at the end of the day that you're not going to interrupt your end users because you know that if end users can't work, then the, the, the project is going to be viewed very negative and it's going to cost the, the company and the organization money. But with your size of your directory services, so as the size rises, so does the complexity because more, more often than not, you have mission critical applications that are using directory services, you have public facing applications, you may have customer facing revenue generating systems that are relying on your directory services. So it really underscores the, the, the need for planning and I don't think anybody ever goes into a migration and says, you know what, I, I, I'm just going to wing it, I, I don't need to plan, but th there's different levels of preparation and, and different levels of, of items based on the complexity that you, you, you really need to, to fold into your, your, uh, your implementation plan. So in regards to complexity, you need to ask the right questions and, and understand at a very basic level what are the hard business requirements. You know, what are, what are the, the driving forces that are funding this project? And, and it may be, like Mickey mentioned, m and it, it may be that you're a large organization and every department has their own forest and now you're con consolidating and, and reducing the complexity. Uh, whatever it is, you need to make sure that you understand all the hidden requirements. There's a lot of apps that rely on your directory service for authentication. So there's always, there, there's always the very easy business requirements that everybody knows but there, there's a lot of hidden requirements that you're not going to know until you start talking to all your stakeholders, all your application owners. Uh, and and they, those things need to be addressed and incorporated and rolled into your migration plan because it, it's the business requirements. Once you properly define them, that often really drive the technical requirements that you end up using for your implementation plan. So as admins, and I, you know, I'm I raise my hand. I'm I'm guilty of this. Oftentimes, we become very enamored and very involved in the really cool new features of the the, the next version of Active Directory that we're migrating to. And you know, it's good reason. That's why we're in the business, right? We're we're, we're techies. We like technology, but we need to make sure that. Th those basic tenets of a sound migration, the things that we're talking about today and that you're going to walk away with, you're going to make sure that those things aren't overlooked. A and depending on what type of business you have, well, you know, a, 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 a hiccup in service, especially if it's a revenue generating system, you know, could be catastrophic. And, you know, I, I use this example a lot. Uh, I, I was performing an AD and exchange migration for a, an airline based out of New York. And I was going through and capturing all the business requirements, working on my design doc. Uh, I, I was very proud. I, I started interviewing uh, application owners. And all of a sudden, I realized that there were specific line of business applications that pilots used while they were in the aircraft on the tarmac in the airports. And when I found that out, you know, that brings a whole new sense of reality around, you know, making sure that any miscue could absolutely be catastrophic. So, you know, planning is really critical here. So Mickey mentioned it that Active Directory it typically just works. It's been around for years in your organization. You may have the same directory, and it may have been put in production in the early 2000s, and it just keeps getting upgraded, right? So, you know, what's going on in that database that you may or may not know about? You know, there's a lot of a lot of hands that it, 
that have been in that pot over the years. So making sure that you, you have a, a really good understanding of where you're at now is key. So when we talk about planning, just to kind of sum this up, um, successful migrations, they all exhibit the same success criteria. They all make sure that the, the proper amount of planning and preparation and, and understanding permissions, uh, that's baked into the, the plan. And, and typically, you're only going to be able to answer all these questions and actually really formulate the, 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 the successful criteria for the, the migration by performing an upfront analysis of the environment. And in my experience, typically, these type of projects, it takes a long time to get funded. You, you, you're told to hurry up and wait, and then all of a sudden you're told start on it, and your timeline's been cut in half. So certain things, certain activities have to be cut. A lot of times the, the upfront analysis of the environment falls by the wayside because of those typical types of constraints. So it, it's important to, to really understand that and to, to, be, to be ready for that. So when we're talking about preparation, this, this is key point number two. The discovery, that upfront analysis is key. So you have to understand what's in your environment, what line of business applications, not only are using that, I mean, you did that, uh, you started down that path with the planning, but now that we're in the preparation phase, we actually need to validate and see what's going on to understand the dynamics of the workflows that your end users are leveraging because you need to prevent that loss of operational efficiency, right? So neglecting this discovery part, understanding how your AD not only is set up, but how it's functioning now. You know, what, what are the conflicts? Are there duplicate objects? Are there inactive objects? In the inactive objects, that is one of the major security risks in an organization because if a disabled account is compromised and someone starts using it and it has elevated permissions, is anybody going to know? I mean, if someone starts using my account and changes my password, let's say, I'm going to know. But for those stale accounts, you know, in most cases, you know, many customers aren't going to know that. So, as the, the, the amount of effort that, that goes into preparation, it varies. Mickey had mentioned that, you know, back in the day, d domains uh, or forests were used as logical isolation boundaries, uh, single label domains. You know, you, you look at that today and, and it, you know, it, it, it makes me shiver a little bit, but the, the reality is those are absolutely still in production. So you may be faced or in the unfortunate situation where you have to pay for the sins of the past and, and you need to restructure your environment. So you know, what, what level of effort needs to be done uh, if you're in one of those predicaments? It, it adds a lot of complexity. So really understanding uh, what you have, especially you know, if you had empty roots, you know, that was something that, that was in favor you know, back in the day that, that's not. Uh, you, you need to identify that up front because that's really going to come into play as you start creating your, uh, your, your migration plan. Funny enough, you need to understand your target environment. That may just seem like common sense, but in large organizations, sometimes it's difficult to determine exactly what your you know end end user environment or the 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 end state environment is going to look like. So to to simplify management and create a a, a model that's not as complex. You know, one of the first questions that, that you have to answer is, is the forest or domain that I'm looking to migrate to 
a suitable destination for for my objects. You know, if you have multiple dom domains that you know, or, or it's maybe configured that way because it just that's how it's always been. You know, there may not be a, a good business driver. It may have been it may have been because of an old security recommendation, or you know, that's just the way the admin that was before me you know did it. Either way, you, you need to identify what your target environment looks like, and it, in most cases, that is then going to lead you into what type of migration am I looking at? Is it going to be intraforest? In, in that case, it's the source active directory that will have a bunch of different domains within the context of the same forest, and, and that target domain is just a, a parent of the forest. That, that's intraforest. And when you're faced with those type of migrations, you, there, you know, there's two methods that you can use to facilitate that type of migration. And you, first, you, you can move the users from the, the, the child domain into the source. Or the second option is you could copy the users. So essentially, recreate the user accounts in the parent directory and then synchronize permissions. And if you're using a third-party platform, th this is something that uh, you need to be very careful about because you need to understand exactly how that vendor tackles this question because if you copy, that can create problems. You know, the move process, that should automatically inject the user SID from that source domain into the SID history field uh, of the user that's then then moved and it preserves the object GUID, so that allows the retention of profiles and, and ensures that uh, if you have Exchange or even Office 365, that the the, the, the link, the synchronization link to the to the Azure AD objects are, are maintained. But you know what what's your trust look like? What what are what are the trusts set up? For for that migration, you know that is going to come into play with the the the, the type of migration or the, the sequencing, and, and when users are permitted to migrate and what they're going to have access to, uh, you know, the, using trusts. Unfortunately, I've seen people kind of use that term loosely in describing coexistence between environments, and. Even though a trust, if you have a trust, it's easier and it's relatively smoother from the the end user standpoint. There are times when that may just not be feasible to have a trust. You know, we we talked about understanding your target. We talked about understanding the business requirements. Sometimes the political climate. Sometimes the reason. Maybe it's a merger or acquisition. Or maybe you're divesting a part of the organization and breaking it up. It may not be top, it may not be possible. So there could be a, a roadblock there, and that inability could also be because of the past mistakes. You know, it could be part of paying for the the, the sins of the the past. So if you have a uh, a, a trust list migration. The thing that I'll point out there that the, the the greatest impact is that you're just not you're not able to move in an orderly wave-based fashion. So that's just something to to think about. It's a, it's a true cutover, and, and that can be a daunting task because that really increases the complexity, which obviously increases the planning and the preparation that's needed. Now, from a risk perspective. If you have multiple forests, and they all have trust pointing to one another, as you see in the example here, that can become really complex to understand what forest has rights to what resource in the other forest or domain. And it's just this tangled mess of permissions and inheritance, and it's complex. but there are valid reasons why you know this design may work. Maybe, maybe uh, th th there's a reason for something like an ethic 
ethical firewall of sorts. And, and maybe there's regulatory compliance within your business and, and there needs to be a level of isolation. Either way, it's complex and you need to address it and it needs to be managed not only in a meaningful way, but in, in a way that uh, you can ensure and maintain compliance, especially if you're one of those organizations where you know your your life is gather, governed with SOX compliance, meaning GCC controls, auditing, whether they be monthly, quarterly, annual. Uh, th th there is a risk there, and, and there's the risk of the inherited permissions. There's the risk of the inactive user accounts that uh, are compromised. They have elevated permissions, and, and that's part of the, 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 the security prompting and the security story that drives many to de-risk and mitigate that risk by simplifying and centralizing their, their directory services. So preparation, you know, to, to kind of sum this up, it is key. It, it is one of the first rules of migration. I won't, I won't say it's the first rule of migration, but you need to gather as much detail as you can about what you have. So that means understanding a lot more than just how Active Directory is configured. Active Directory rides on top of a lot of different things, right? So understanding the network infrastructure, the, the network landscape, understanding the, the layout of your data center, if you still have this in a physical data center, your virtualization environment, you know, th those are all things that, that need to be understood around your Active Directory environment. So AD sites, domains, domain controllers, uh, the OU structured, maybe you're using replication like DFS or, or something like that. Do you have Exchange installed? You know, what are the other line of business applications that have extended the schema? You know, the, these, these are all things that uh, really fuel and go into the, the, the preparation and, and that discovery environment and, and activity. Yeah, and I think that uh, especially in the organizations where you have line of business applications and those usually would be some kind of a legacy applications which you don't really know how they use Active Directory, what are their requirements are, and we've seen examples in the past of um, a production floor actually stops on, in one of the manufacturing uh, organizations and that's due to a change in the Active Directory and nobody thought that the machines on the floor have anything to do with the Active Directory until after the change we found out that the authentications of the machines in terms of the application was actually built on the Active Directory. So doing the mapping plan which might be a very complex things to do but it is a crucial component to every migration project. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it all comes down to talking to the application owners because inevitably, that that DOS-based application that is absolutely criti critical to process credit card transactions within your organization, the person that installed that has been gone for ten years. So you know, it, it's it's never an easy story to once you start going through it and, and tackling those those easy line of business, the, the, the SQLs, the exchange, you know, the, 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 the CRM applications, ERP applications that everybody has where there's a lot of documented information of how to move and the reliance on AD. Once you get into the nitty gritty details, you know, that, that's where it takes up a lot of time and often that time you may not be afforded that time or someone may be trying to take that time away from you before you move on to the next step. That's that's exactly that's exactly the problem. In many of the of those uh, situations, you will have that line of business application performing a, a one single task, which is done, let's say, once a month, because it's you don't need to do it more than that. Like if you do payments for that or something to the matter. And as you mentioned before, the organization, the management is pushing to have this thing done as fast as possible. And sometimes just being able to explain that that might not be the best approach can also be something that you need to consider. Right. Absolutely. So the, the, the third item, 
uh, the, the planning and preparation, that, that may have seemed a, a little bit high level, but there's nuances to that, right? Uh, when you get in, like, like Mickey just said, when you, when you have to drill down and really understand and have an accounting for every application and reliance on your directory services that's been running since the beginning of time, or before you were even in IT, you know, that, that becomes difficult. The, the, the third area that I've seen not only cause problems in AD migrations, but causes problems in exchange migrations is permissions. And it's a really difficult story there because you, you could account for permissions, but one specific thing could manifest itself down the road in, in very bizarre, inconsistent ways, which just makes troubleshooting really, really difficult, especially when there's production issues. So the first step in understanding permissions to me, and this is really reinforcing planning and preparation, don't bring any garbage forward. <laughs> if you know that you have stale accounts and you know there's specific problems, I mean, that, that, that garbage, you know, and I say that in jest, but it represents not only complexity, but it's a security risk. It's a, it could be a potential exploit, like we talked about, the unused accounts. They could be even accidentally enabled by somebody and used, maybe not intentionally, and cause a problem, introduce malware. You know, so as part of any migration project, any unused or unneeded security objects, don't bring the, the, the garbage forward, so to speak. So understanding how permissions are actually granted. So let, let's kind of peel back the, the layers of the onion as it, as it were. When you choose to collapse domains or forest, understanding how these permissions are granted is key because it's a security identifier, a SID, it's this key that's used by Active Directory to identify who you are. And in each one of your accounts, so your personal AD account, has a unique SID that's been issued by the, the AD domain where your account was created in. And Active Directory uses these SIDs, these keys, three different ways. Uh, it, it identifies the owner of a, or, or a group of an object. It, it's used uh, with ACID or, or access control entries to essentially be the, the, the gatekeeper of who's allowed access, who's denied access, or if you access this, I'm going to audit your access attempt. Uh, and then tokens, access tokens are, are also used to, to identify the user and, and all the groups that that user belongs to. So when a user logs in, when you log into AD, all the SIDs for the groups that you're a member of, because not only does your AD account get a SID, but all the groups that are created get a SID as well. So all of the groups that you belong to are added to your token. And, and I use, uh, I don't, the animation isn't working here, but I, I use the example of SIDs are like keys, and, and then it, it's like all these different keys are added to your keychain, right? So when you go to present yourself, you go to open up a file on a, on a share, you're presenting your key ring and figuring out which key works to, to be granted access to, to, to that share or, or, or to that file. So that's great. You know, if, if you have all your keys in your keychain, all your SIDs, and you go to access something, if you don't have a key that matches what's on the list, you're not going to be gained entry, right? You're going to get an access denied message. Uh, otherwise, you know, the, the, the key with the highest permission is granted, and you know, you, you, it could be any, any type of combination of SIDs that you have on your key ring. Now, SID history. If you're collapsing domains or forests, you're going to want a, a period of coexistence, right? So if you have 10 different forests and 
it's a spidered web of trust and you you have that security issues or you want to mitigate the risk of all of that you're consolidating down to, to one forest um, you would typically set up a trust and then that trust would allow you to leverage what we call SID history and it, it's an attribute within your your security objects and that SID history field it was really designed to, to hold all your SIDs all your keys in your key ring that you had previously been assigned to in your the, your source domain so when you start using your new account in, in the target forest or domain you get a new SID right and you don't have all those keys that you had before in the source. So SID history essentially, you know, as that access token is built at logon time, all the SIDs that you had access to are 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 cop or are being maintained in your SID history attribute field. So you have all the keys that were on your key ring. That works great when you have a trust, but you know there there are other issues that happened with SID history. It's a great tool. It, it helps support large migrations, but it's not a get out of jail free card. There, there's a, there's some issues that could happen. The main issue that that I've seen is that each time you are granted access to a group, uh, groups that are groups that groups that are members of groups. You know, they all have different SIDs, right? Well, this is not that well documented, but there is a maximum token size. So you're, there can only be so many keys on your key ring at one time. So a lot of companies, larger organizations, where they have a lot of groups and a lot of users and nested groups in particular, they may struggle to identify and fix when users have more keys on their key ring than they're allowed. So the more groups you belong to, the larger your access token comes, becomes, more keys that you have. And the, the actual issue is when you try and access a network file share, you try to access a web server, uh, so you're leveraging SQL authentication, exchange, that, that's where I've seen it the most. When you try to access a resource, you're trying to log into Outlook Web App, for instance. The access token that you have, that you pass to the remote system to, to have access, to be granted access, if you have too many keys on your key ring, what's going to happen is th there's a random approach where random keys that you have are discarded. So you may, one of the keys to access to log into or leverage IIS to, to log into uh, Outlook on the web, for instance, that may be discarded. And what makes this just crazy to troubleshoot, it, it, you, you could probably tell it's driven me up the wall in past engagements, is that you may get a trouble ticket where a user can't log into Outlook web app or, or another web resource or a file share. You get the ticket. You look at the permissions, oh, you know, everything's set up, this, this looks fine. You call the customer, or, and all of a sudden it's working. Okay, whatever. Well, you get the same ticket the next day. They can't access it now. And then you call them, oh, it's working now. So it's this intermittent behavior, and it's because it's just the, the, it's the, the, the random nature of you have too many keys to fit on your key ring. Some days, the keys that get discarded are not the keys that you need to access the specific resource. So troubleshooting that, long and short, can be difficult. So really, really understand uh, where, where, where you are before you actually go through with the migration. Uh, there are a lot of scripts out there that will, that will list out the token. Uh, you can take a look at all the token sizes and verify that against the max uh, token size uh, that, that uh, your Windows server resources allow uh, any of the more modern supported operating systems have a very large supporting token size param parameter 
some of the more legacy operating systems are, are a little more restrictive. And you know, we, we all have legacy. We, we all probably still have 2003 boxes in, in some nook and cranny of the office. And I guess that one of the things that make this so annoying and so hard to deal with is the fact that, as you mentioned, it's random. So it happens, and then it goes away. And then it happens, and then it goes away. Drives me crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, so track of objects and attributes. Um, what can go wrong? <laughs> which is kind of a lot but um, so as you can see there is a list of different things that uh, we kind of gathered from a variety of, of customers that we've seen and things that went wrong but I will not go on through all of them I'll just point out to some of the examples here so one of the things that we we've seen uh, recently is a did file that actually started to grow I would say like crazy following the migration in this case the migration was to um, a cloud-based environment and the company started with the five gigabytes of of, um, of the did file and during a period of time it, it just kept on growing while nobody was able to figure out what's going on and that it's at the point that we got involved it was already that that database got over 25 gigabytes which is quite wow. big if you think in the period of time and 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 it still was growing so after the investigation what we were able to figure out is that the attribute of roaming credentials was constantly updated and that was to do misconfiguration of Skype that caused the updates of certificates and as you probably know certificates and pictures are the two biggest space consumers in Active Directory so imagine a situation where you have those updated on a daily basis and it's very hard to figure out exactly what's causing it. So that's something that to pay attention to. Um, another example is the trust account passport being modified. So as in most of the migrations that I've seen before, you start by creating the trust to the new environment and usually the trust stays there for a period of time. and in some of the situation, based on the organization policy, somebody might modify the password for that trust from one of the organizational sites only, which will of course break the trust and which will of course make the users lose the ability to access the resources. Um, so in those cases, of course, what you need to do is to be able to recover the password back to what it used to be. Um, which also means that it's a good practice to know what that password actually was because <laughs> that in many cases would not be the case. Um, another example which I think was also quite interesting is the users that cannot log in following the migration and that's because they have smart cards requirement but and that's implied on both of the organizational sites but then you figure out that the new CA in the, in the new site does not trust the certificates that were provided with the smart cards on the original forest. So all of a sudden, we have an issue there. Um, so basically, the recommendation here is keep in mind that things might go wrong and will go wrong, and you need to make sure that you can get insights on, on what are the changes that are happening in the environment following the transition to the new organizational side and then if required you need to be able to revert them as quickly as possible. Verifying that you can recover from Active Directory downtime. So I would say one thing that I think that we should have mentioned and kind of skipped uh, during the, the preparation step is that if you can it would always would be a suggestion to create a lab environment that is as close as possible to the current production environment that you have and the best way that to access something like that is that if you can actually spin out a copy of your production environment that is of course needs to be done in a completely isolated environment because you don't want the environments to collapse um, but this is something that is also very highly recommended to just spin out a lab environment which is identical to your production environment 
and then you need to be just prepared to have a plan of, and that's back to the planning, of what should be done in case we have a full forest migration, um, or we just basically have a full forest collapse uh, during the migration process. How do we revert back to the previous state? Or if we are running scripts that are now modifying the environment and we need to, to do that as a preparation to the migration process, and then all of a sudden we figure out that based on the changes that we did, users can no longer access or cannot log in the environment or whatever the case might be, how do we perform a mass um, reverse of the number of objects and users that we need to be able to revert um, if something goes sideways? So those are the things that I would recommend to consider uh, and that's probably prior that you start to do any other changes to the environment because as we mentioned your environment probably has not gone through that many changes recently and you're probably going to find out things that were just lying there for a long period of time and now being modified for the first time after a very long period. Now in your, uh, in your experience with this, uh, you know, I, I think if you ask, if you have a checkbox, uh, you're going through your planning stage, you know, backup, do you have a current backup? That's typically on every migration checklist, no matter the application or, or the service. But it, it, in your experience, do customers typically test that or know how to restore? So, like for instance, the the domain partition. You know, do customers actually know how to do that, or have they done that? That that's a great question. Yeah, we, we more often than less <laughs> see customers that assume that by having a, a backup they can actually recover from, they're done. Um, but you're right, it's it's a very not straightforward process and it is Microsoft recommendation to do those tests at least once a year, usually more than that. And of course it's a recommendation to do them before you do something as massive as an Active Directory migration uh, where you want to make sure that you actually can recover the environment in case something goes wrong. And the disaster recovery uh, or the recovery in general of Active Directory, as you guys probably know, is not a straightforward process. Having the backup actually would be just the first step, uh, a necessary one. Without the backup, you cannot do much, that's for sure. But there is still a whole process that needs to be executed in order to do something with that backup. And the recommendation is, of course, to try that at least once in a lab environment to make sure that you will be actually ready and be able to execute when things go wrong. So the conclusions. Um, AD migrations can go wrong. We all heard about Murphy and we all know that if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. And I think that as, as Justin um, mentioned several times during the presentation, planning and mapping stages are super critical um, and in terms of the preparation and many times the more you spend on planning and the mapping stages is most likely that you will be able to mitigate most of the, ring of the risks during the migration process itself. Um, having the ability to monitor objects and or attributes after and during the migration stage is also very critical. You want to make sure that if after the migration something stops working, you want to be able to figure out as, as fast as possible what is causing the issue. Why are we all of a sudden experiencing that? And then based on that, you also want to be able to take action in terms of uh, reverting back and, res and recovering from that situation. It might be something that you need to modify in the new environment. It might be something that you need to stop doing in the new environment. Whatever the case might be, you need to be able to figure out what's going on. And then in the worst case scenario when things go really sideways and you need to be able to recover from downtime, you do want to be able to do it as fast as possible because even if you had the best migration project ever, any downtime will eventually lead the organization to kind of feel that it was not 
really successful one. So this is also something that you should consider. Yeah, and, and, and the, the summary for me, the, the key takeaway is plan, prepare, and understand your permissions. And when all else fails, make sure that you, you, you really understand your backup scheme, not only just looking at the check mark that you have a, a solid backup, but you actually have went through and you know how to actually do it because there's nothing like trying to read a manual on how to do something when you know a, a bunch of people are standing over your shoulder because things are down. So plan, yeah. plan, plan. That's definitely not the time. Definitely. Um, Metal, do, do you want us to take questions from the audience? I think that we have like a minute or two left. Yeah, it seems like we're very short on time. So what I would do is, Mickey, if you can uh, go down to the slide for the questions. Um, uh, I would say for all the people who ask questions here today, we'll be happy to get back with you offline over email and provide you with the answers to the questions you asked. Um, out of respect for everybody's times and everybody's plans, I would say let's wrap up for today. Of course, if you have any additional questions, the panelists have agreed to provide their email addresses and you can email them directly uh, and get responses to your uh, questions following this presentation. Uh, thank you, Mickey and Justin, for a great and elaborate presentation here today. And thank you to everyone who joined us for this live session. We're happy to have you. Uh, with that, I would say let's wrap up and we'll be in touch in a few days with the recording. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.